You're very welcome to this talk, Thursday the 17th of June. Now, there's some very interesting information just published on the Centers for Disease Control website about seroprevalence in the United States. And as you know, seroprevalence is the number of people in the population that are testing antibody positive for SARS coronavirus 2. In other words, they have the immunoglobulins in their blood. They've been exposed to the vaccine or the virus. And this is actually starting to tell us some things that are fairly fundamental about the nature of this pandemic, actually, and has got implications for the states and the rest of the world. So uh, let's have a look at this first of all. Really quite interesting. It's a little complicated, but we'll try and go through it. Now, it's based on this site here. So National Blood Donor Zero Prevalence Survey. And this is uh, live from the uh, Centers for Disease Control uh, website and of course I always include the link you can uh, check out the information for yourself as opposed to taking my word for it. So it's a national blood donor seroprevalence survey. So clearly data is gathered from blood donors. Now um, blood donors probably, I don't know, blood donors are taking interest in health related issues so maybe they're more likely to get vaccine than non-blood donors. I don't really know that. Probably of anything more likely I would have thought. But we don't need to know that for, for this first part. Um, estimates of the population 16 and over who've developed antibodies. So this is the zero prevalence in the population over 16. Now of course the question always is if someone has antibodies did that occur as a result of natural exposure to the virus in other words were they infected whether symptomatic or asymptomatic or of course now did they get it as a result of vaccination and it, with the american data we can we can get a handle on this now because when the the uh, biochemists and people in the labs actually do the tests all they say is the antibodies are there they can't say whether it came from the vaccine or whether it came from uh, natural exposure to the virus but this data does tell us. So um, here we have, th th this is a graph from the site here, zero prevalence study over time. So um, I think you can probably see that. That's 100% there. That's 50%, 25%, 75%. And we can see that by January, February, that's about March. And in fact, this data here is from about the 21st of March. 2021 and we can see there that the zero prevalence is getting towards the 50 percent mark that's the 50 percent mark there so pretty high zero prevalence as of the 21st of march and to give the precise figures we have here zero prevalence was actually 49.1 percent on the 21st of march so this is some time ago when this data has been collated from now, this is the interesting bit. On the 21st of March, pretty well 50%, 49.1% of people, and this is for the whole uh, United States, 49.1% were zero prevalent. But at that time, vaccinations were only 13.7%. So we can see that the majority of the zero prevalence in the United States was from natural infection. So United States was natural immunity key. Um, it's looking like at least as the 21st of March, it was a much bigger chunk than vaccination was. And this is surprising. It is surprising, but um, it's interesting. So the United States, it looks like, was well on the way to what we might call herd immunity before the vaccination program really got going. Of course, there was a great peak of cases in the States, as we know, uh, New Year, about January time, similar to the UK. Now, other things that are interesting to note here. Cumulative reported cases at that time were 8.7%. And yet we know that now 50% had antibodies, therefore had been infected. So we can see that the real number, well, what is it? It's times, is it times six? It's at least times five, isn't it? So the real number infected was at least five or six times higher than those being officially diagnosed through PCR testing. But most of the immunity, as we see, coming from natural exposure rather than the 
vaccine. So, um, the vaccine's helping, of course, massively. <laughs> but um, but let's carry on with this sort of line of thought. Now, deaths of the t as of the 21st of March... Unfortunately, now the death rate in the United States has just topped 600,000. The Centers for Disease Control website doesn't tell us that yet. It will come up to date soon, um, but it's actually over 600,000 now in the United States. But as of the 21st of March, it was 550,559 as per the uh, CDC cumulative graphics data. So that was the number of deaths at that time population in the united states uh, 33 million 49 percent are infected uh, if, if we extrapolate that to the whole population um, so that would be 162 million people as of the 21st of march in the united states had been exposed to the virus 49 percent of the population had been exposed 162 million people now what that means is the infection fatality rate. So if you can compare that number there, 550,559, take that as a percentage of this number here, 162 million. That gives us an infection fatality rate of 0.4. So of all those infected, 0.4% died. And of course, this is during the first part of the pandemic. The exact figure is 0.33984. Five, so 0.4%. Interesting, similar to the data in the UK. But if this pandemic had gone on, the death rate would have fallen because, of course, the people that died first were the elderly and those with comorbidities who were more likely to die. As infection spreads amongst the younger age group, lower, much lower amounts would have died. So the overall uh, infection fatality rate, had this pandemic just been allowed to run rampant through the United States over time, could have been under 0.4%, or could it? We're going to qualify that. But, but that, that's, that, that's, that's an interesting observation, 0.4% in the UK and the US. Pretty well the same as the UK data. Uh, so the infection fatality rate as, as of the 21st of March, 0.4%. Now, just a couple of things to notice here. Uh, herd immunity, adults with at least one vaccine now in the States, uh, it's 64.7% now have had at least one vaccine. So the zero positivity now, of course, would be much higher. So on the 21st of March, zero positivity would be uh, was 49.1%. Now it would be certainly more than 64.7% because they've had one dose of the vaccine. But what's interesting here is what is the zero prevalence now and what is the state of immunity now is the United States at or near herd immunity? Because we've had 64.7% of the population with at least one dose of the vaccine there. Plus we know that the zero prevalence way back on the 21st of March was... a uh, 49.1 now there will be an overlap between these two but um 49.1 percent but we can see now that because most of these were natural immunity the total immunity now is the proportion of these that have natural immunity plus the 67, sorry, the 64.7 percent that have been had the first dose of vaccine. So what the total levels of immunity are in the United States is hard to say, but the zero prevalence would be 64.7 percent plus whatever percentage of these were natural immunity. It could easily be another um, 30 percent. But of course, some of these will overlap with some of these because some of these people that zero prevalent then have since had the vaccine. So we can't give a modern figure, an up to date figure. But it's clearly higher than that. The big variable here, though, is, of course, the new Delta variant, which is about 10 or 11 percent of cases now in the States. It's probably doubling every 10 days or so and will become the most prevalent variant in the United States. Almost certainly. That, 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 that's what I think a lot of people are thinking that. And of course, to get full protection from that, you need two doses of vaccine. So this things were going so well. And yet now this Delta variant raised its uh, ugly head, unfortunately. 
So that's one thing, the the, uh, the infection fatality rate, we can say it's about 0.4% in the States, which is interesting. But hospitalizations in the States, now as of now, uh, 2,255,380 people, well, as of a few days ago, that's from the CDC website, have been hospitalized in the United States with um, COVID-19. Now, the big question in my mind is, what proportion of these would have died without hospitalisation? How many of that two and a quarter million would have died without hospitalisation? Now, we haven't got figures on this. That The vast majority of these would have been given oxygen. And we know that tragically in the recent surge in India, a lot of people died through simple lack of oxygen. So how many of these would have died without oxygen, without steroids, without the other supportive treatments, without the antibiotics? that has been given uh, by hospitalizations we don't know now th that's the figure now to two to two two and a quarter million now this is the graphic for the hospitalizations in the states here and of course we see that the peak in hospitalizations in the states was here at january so march would be round about there so you know at, so these people have been hospitalized since then so at an estimate i'd say about two million people had been hospitalized in the united states by the 21st of March. Unfortunately, it doesn't give you a cumulative graph, so I can't give you a more precise figure than that, but it'd be about around about 2 million people hospitalised in the United States by the 21st of March. How many of those would have died? Of course, we don't know, but it could have been. It could have been getting towards the 2 million. Now, if that's the case, what that would mean is that uh, instead of being 550,000, the two million that were hospitalised, many of those, we can say for certain that a lot of those would have died. We really don't know. Probably at least half of those would have died. Maybe more. Maybe more. So um, let's suppose. Let's suppose, just for argument's sake, half of those would have died. So that would have put the death rate up to over one and a half million, and potentially up to two and a half million, had hospital facilities not been available uh, in the. United States and the point there is not only for countries that don't have uh, good hospital facilities like the United States does but the point that really struck me there was had it not been for the non-pharmaceutical interventions the restrictions on movement the lockdowns uh, the mask wearing then the large proportion of that 49.1% that were uh, that became seroprevalent, they became seroprevalent over a long period of time. They could have become seroprevalent much more quickly. Much more quickly. And the few percent of those that were going to become ill and hospitalised, the 5% or so, they would have been hospitalised much more quickly. And 2 million people can't get into hospital at the same time. So the fact that the United States hospitalisation system was able to cope with this 2 million people was because it was able to do it over a period of time. Now, clearly, the it's, it's almost like a normal distribution curve. It's like a Gaussian bell curve, isn't it, that? But that's actually the total figures. That, that these are the different age groups in the States that were hospitalised. So had these people not been hospitalised, people in all these age groups would have died much more so than they did. And if all of these... So that, that's from October to... Uh, eight, so that's from October to March, so... October, November, December, January, February. So that's over six months. But without the mitigation measures, this could have all happened over a month or two. And quite easily, another million people would have died. So have all the lockdown and mitigation measures in the States uh, been worth it? Well, if, if you think, if you accept the reasoning here that that saved at least a million lives, I think that's a pretty short debate, don't you? Just imagine the, the death rate in the United States could be, instead of 600,000, it could be 1,600,000 or even conceivably as high as 2,600,000. So I think it's been worth it to save that many lives, potentially because it spread out the time over which those people were hospitalised over. So I thought that brought together quite a few interesting things actually um, together and I, ho I hope you found that interesting and, and uh, helpful I, I think it's been worthwhile and I, if you're watching the videos I'm sure you think it's been worthwhile
you know, it means that someone you know would have died. A family member would have died if you're in the States. And, uh, and of course, the same strain in the, U- in the UK, everywhere. If we hadn't taken the mitigation strategies, health services would have been overwhelmed. And in the States, that could have meant up to an additional two million deaths. So I'm going to leave that there for now because that was a bit complicated. So I'll, I'll leave you to uh, have a think about that and I'll have a think about <laughs> I'd love to think as well. I did have some more things to do, but we'll do those on the next video. So thank you for watching this one.